Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Gun Show. I'm your host, Dave Womack, from theprepperproject.com. I want you to hear this and think about it very deeply. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and, uh, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter, so help me God. That's right, that's your oath if you've joined any part of the military, or similar oath if you've been in law enforcement or other similar types of activities. We've got uh, a great guest with us today, Stuart Rhodes from o OathKeepers.org. He'll be joining us in just a moment, but first, a word from our sponsors. All right, and as always, guys, we are listener supporters, so please check out the sponsors, buy their stuff, make them happy. Let them know you heard about them at the gun show. All right, so joining us all the way from Montana in the middle of nowhere where his, uh, his internet connection seems to be just slightly better than a, a shoestring and a tin can, but he is with us today in high <laughs> spirits. So Stuart Rhodes uh, from OathKeepers.org. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Doing fine. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Um, so... I've got to ask you here, for people that um, that don't know you and, and vice versa, you may not know some of our audience. Our audience is preparedness, uh, mindset, survivalist, prepper, that kind of thing, um, for the most part. we got a lot of gun enthusiasts out there. We've got a lot of other people that just want to be self-reliant. They want to fill their brain with as much information as they can. Obviously, you've done um, a lot in that area, and I'd like to try to share your message with our team and our listenership as much as possible. So. Um, if you will, teach us a little bit about um, what exactly is Oath Keepers. What we are is an association of both current serving and retired military uh, peace officers and first responders. Like I was a paratrooper in the Army. A lot of our guys are, are former military. We have current serving military, cur current serving police officers across the country and sheriffs. And we also have a lot of EMTs, firefighters. Um, I was a volunteer firefighter in Montana, and now I'm in EMT school right now, as a matter of fact. Sure. So we, the whole point of Oath Keepers is to reach out to those who've taken the oath um, who are the tip of the spear. These are the ones who, on the one hand, if they're current serving, may be given the orders to violate your rights, like to confiscate your guns, like, as was done during Katrina. Um, or on the flip side, they're retired and they're veterans or, or retired military or first responders who have a lot of knowledge who can help their communities and have an obligation under their oath. Us veterans have an ob obligation and duty to defend the Constitution. As far as we're concerned, the oath does not expire until you do. As long as you're on this side of the grass, you have a duty and obligation to defend your country and, and to defend your Constitution in particular. That makes so it's about that. And, and we have a two-pronged mission, which is one is to reach out to the current serving. We've got billboards across the country outside of military bases. We hand out pocket constitutions outside the bases. We do all we can to reach out to the guys with the guns, in particular, in the military, who would be given the orders. The bad guys, the domestic enemies of the Constitution, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, they can't do it without, they can't kill the Constitution once and for all without the willing compliance and, and obedience of the military and police. Mm -hmm. And so we reach out to them to get as many of them on our side as possible. We talk about Nuremberg, how, you know, just following orders is no excuse. The My Lai Massacre, Abu Ghraib, we go through all the lessons of history about how they have an obligation and duty to refuse unlawful orders. And a lot of them know this from the military training, but what they don't get enough training in is the Constitution itself. And that's where you see things like Katrina, where they're, you know, when they're being used domestically and when we're seeing more and more uh, planning, overt planning, and, and also chatter about using the military domestically, when they're used here at home, they had better know the Constitution, and in particular the Bill of Rights, because they don't know it. How are they going to know when to say no? And yeah. So that's the that's the one prong is the outreach to the current serving. But the other side is is the obligation of us veterans. And in on that front, we're very much into preparedness. But what we want to see people do is prepare as communities, not just as a secret squirrel, isolated <laughs> prepper. That's not going to save freedom in this country. It's not going to save your country, and ultimately, it's not even going to save your life because you'll come out of your your hidey hole, and what are you going to face? You're going to face a local warlord who set himself up as the Grand Poobah. You'll face a domestic dictatorship, or you'll face a foreign occupier who has come in to fill the vacuum after a catastrophic economic collapse. So we think that the key is is, is community preparedness. Okay. Let's jump back for a moment and talk a little on the political side of things. Um, 
I heard you kind of say a couple things like, you know, on our side, we want the military on our side. We don't want them using being used against us. Um, it, the way you worded it makes me understand that you, like myself, believe, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but you believe that possibly our political system is failing and we might be headed towards uh, quite a hailstorm. Um, you know, and, and I guess there's, there's no way of dodging this. Um, our, our president's becoming a dictator, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of, a lot of fear and, um, and concerns based around that. I don't know if you'd be willing to shed some light on your thoughts on, on our current political climate. Um, take it as far as you want. We got a, we got a pretty good listenership. Um, I think, I think the, the uh, political climate is foobar. You know what that means, right? Yeah. Effed up beyond repair. And the big reason is, is we're actually in a far worse position than the Founding Fathers were. In their day, it was a pretty clear divide between the Patriots and the Loyalists and the Tories. So there was, there was a pretty clear divide there. We have a three-way fight going on in this country. It'd be great if all we had to worry about were the Democrats, and that was the only bad guys we had to worry about. But that's not the reality. The reality is, is that we have two different branches of the same hydra, you got totalitarians on the right who are every bit as dangerous as the totalitarians on the left. Yeah. Guys like John McCain who who wrote the NDAA detention provisions. Guys like Lindsey Graham, you know, shut up, you don't get a lawyer. We're going to torture you and make you talk. You've got no rights at all once we point our finger at you. Guys like Peter King who who supports every you know, assault weapons ban and and magazine ban. He's a Republican from from New York, but he's his whole focus is on growing the police state and he sees nothing wrong with that and so these are people who are every bit the traitor and destroyer of the Bill of Rights as anything inside the Obama administration so that's where we are we, have to, we need to realize we've got life and death destroyers of liberty enemies of liberty on the right just as much as on the left and so it really is it's between liberty and totalitarian uh, police state mentality, you know, the government supremacist, and they're on both sides. So look at Congress right now. What what number of congressmen actually take their oath seriously and understand the Constitution and actually defend the Bill of Rights? It's a min minuscule number. Yeah. You know, you got Justin Amash from, from Michigan. You got, you know, Rand Paul. You've got maybe Ted Cruz. He's still kind of a question mark. You've got a small handful of people who really understand the Constitution and are willing to stand up for it. And so, you know, look at the NDAA, a bipartisan assault on the Bill of Rights. Look at the Patriot Act, same thing. When they voted to, to, to uh, order the, F, F, uh, the uh, FAA to plan for 30,000 drones over the U.S. skies, that was also a bipartisan vote. So we're pretty bad. We're in pretty big trouble. It's pretty foobar. That's why we tell our guys the focus needs to be local. You focused on you, your family, your neighborhood, your town, your county, and your state, and you work in that order. And that's how you you have to do it from the bottom up. We've got to restore things, restore the republic from the bottom up. You're not going to do it from the top down. Yeah. It's 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 really kind of like arguing over who's going to be the new captain on Titanic while it's going down. <laughs> it's too late for that. You're not going to fix D.C. As Sheriff Mack always says, it's too late to fix D.C. D.C. is, is gone. Yeah. There's going to be an economic collapse long before you can ever clean out Washington, D.C. So get ready for it locally. Now, back in our Founding Fathers days um, and, you know, uh, what, 50 years after the, the forming of our country, and maybe my numbers are a little off here, but early on, if somebody... Um, disobeyed their oath, or um, they, they'd be hung, they'd be killed, they'd be lynched. Well, they'd be they'd be tarred and feathered, probably first first off. <laughs> so that was that was one of the first things that, that would happen to them, right? So so then, how did we get to where we are now? Because even just merely talking about this, uh, like uh, like Dinesh, just uh, I can never say his name right. The guy that wrote uh, 2016 Obama's America, that that whole movement, um, the movie. Uh, he was just arrested for pretty much trumped up charges, I believe. Um, when the political oh, I hadn't heard about that. Oh yeah, is it Dinesh D'Souza? Is that how you say his name? He basically um, he got out. He was arrested um, for paying apparently twenty thousand dollars to a political party, um, and you know, so he was arrested for that. He got out on half million dollars bail. 
Um, the irony behind it is Obama can go have a dinner for you know forty thousand dollars a plate, where this guy can't give twenty thousand dollars to somebody um, without it being right. you know an issue. Anyway, hindsight, you look at this stuff, and obviously people are being targeted. That's come out. That's been exposed. Um, we have no rights anymore. I don't you know it, it's we're barely hanging in there, as I think you're aware. Um, but right. but then what is the solution? Because we can't just go call for lynching or tar and feathering of any of our political figures. Um, we would be really persecuted and uh, and and put away for life if we even thought of doing that. So what sorts of action can we take? And I think this ties back to some of your new projects. What can we do to make a difference within our communities to then hope hopefully help on the broader picture? Uh, of, of just our whole political climate fixing America. Well, kind of like I said a minute ago, the big problem is is we have such a, such a you know an infestation of oath breakers in Washington D.C. The founders anticipated that there'd be some who would not keep their oath, and they put remedies in place. But they presumed that the majority in Congress would be people sincerely in defense of the Constitution, and they gave Congress the power to to discipline its own members remove them from office, and then there's also impeachment to remove the president from office or to remove judges from office. What do you do, though, when you've got a supermajority of oath breakers who all agree on, on, on wiping their ass with the Constitution that's, that removes that political remedy? And so, you know, the first step is, is for not necessarily your audience, but Americans need to go look in the mirror. And every one of them who voted for an oath-breaking Republican because they were afraid of you know, the, the Democrat voted for the so-called lesser two evils, they are responsible for this current situation we're in. It is their responsibility. So the first thing they need to do is, is like the whore, when Christ talked to the whore in the Bible, you know, go forth and sin no more. You have no right, none of us have any right to demand resignations of anybody or call for lynchings or, or tars and feathering of anyone if we voted for an oath breaker and we intend to continue doing that. So the first step is stop voting for oath breakers. But mm -hmm. as I said a minute ago, you know, even when you do that, it's important for you to have a clear conscience and know that you're not contributing to the destruction of your country. That's the first step. Stop voting for them. If you vote for an oath breaker, it makes you one. It's ridiculous to argue that somehow it's okay to vote for someone like Romney who violated his oath when he signed the Massachusetts assault weapons ban that vote is still in keeping with your oath, give me a break. So stop yeah. doing it. Stop doing the lesser two evils. That's how both political parties get obedience from their rank and file, is they scare them with the, the opposition, and they say, you must vote for our oath breaker because their oath breaker is even worse. And so what do you wind up with? You know, you take a reduced dose of poison, you're still killing yourself. Yeah. We've done this over and over again. And so that's the first step, is a moral imperative is stop supporting oath breakers. And then you got to clean them out, and I would recommend they start at the very bottom. The target number one in the most important office is your local sheriff. Is he someone who's going to keep his oath or not? If he's a demonstrated oath breaker, he's got to go. If he's somebody with a question mark, put him on the spot and make him commit. Will he obey, like say, for example, federal uh, gun control laws that violate your Second Amendment rights? Will he refuse to obey them or not? Huh. And so, you know, will he and, and will he stand up against them and protect you? It's if funny you mention not, that. I'm gonna just jump in here real quick. Some of the yeah, people who listen to my show know the story, but I lived in Orlando for five years, um, and I listened to a video from Southern Prepper One on YouTube, and he said exactly what you're saying. And so uh, he said, "Go to your sheriff, ask him, make a meeting, say, hey, if." And at the time that I did this, I said, "Hey, I sat down and I said, if, if Feinstein's bill goes through and the law of the land changes to where." You will, you know, they will confiscate guns. Where do you stand? He looks me in the eyes. He said, "I'm law enforcement. If the law of the land changes, I'll enforce it." And I said, "You know, you'll you'll break your oath." And he just kept saying, I'm "Law enforcement. If the law of the land changes, I'll enforce it." And I said, "That's all I need to know. I'm out of here." And, well, uh, and I moved. the supreme law of the land is the Constitution, <laughs> though. That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah, and so. so I moved up to an area where the, you go to the sheriff's page and he says, "Hey, like it or love it, doesn't matter. Uh, hate it, whatever." This is a law of the land. It's a constitutional support it. And so uh, to me, Orlando was too broken to even start to fix. Um, right. Maybe you call it running. I don't know. I, I call it yeah. <laughs> preserving my own hide. Uh, I, I, call it, I call it getting the high ground. It's a strategic move. I, mean, I moved from Nevada to Montana. I improved my position for myself and my family for the same reasons. It's, yeah. This is a more same reason why you moved to, to Idaho. It's the American readout, right? Yeah. There's a lot of truth to that. Um, 
in fact, uh, Brandon Smith, who is one of our associate editors, he writes for altmarket.com, he and I did a, did a, a co-authorship of a piece where we talked about strategic relocation. And we, we advocated that people who are hardcore liberty people, they should get to a more like-minded area and a place that's easier to defend yeah. and easier to be self-sustaining in. And a city's not it. Like, I used to live in Vegas. That's like a that's like a moon station. It's not natural. It shouldn't <laughs> exist. And when, if there's an economic collapse or any kind of catastrophe, an EM, EMP strike, uh, Vegas is going to be like it's going to be like you know twenty twenty eight days or twenty nine. What's that? Twenty eight days later, it'll be like that, like the right. zombie words. You know, it'll be a. It's not going to be survivable. It'll be a so disaster. I think there's nothing wrong with getting out of places like that if you can, or in, if you're in a state and you can't move out of the state. At least get to more rural community. So at least get as far away from the big cities as you can. And there is a difference in the mentality in rural America. There just is. People who live in rural America are much more self-sufficient. Like here in Montana, everybody around me here is on a well. We use wood-burning stoves. Most of us have propane um, for our for our cook stoves or wood. And so we're already like 85 percent, 90 percent off grid. If the power went out, we wouldn't freeze to death. We'd still have water. You know, yeah. we, we could still live. And so there's just a big difference in the mentality. And like where I live, it's 15 miles off the nearest highway. There's no nearby hospital. we got to provide our own medical care, which is why I'm in, in EMT school right now. So we have to provide for ourselves. Volunteer fire departments, you don't see a sheriff's deputy. No one around here freaks out because there's no cop next door to them. They right. take care of themselves and each other. We yeah, have a great call community service. You know, we, we take care of ourselves. I was finding up here, too, one of the big things, and I was reminded of it when we just had a couple of our best friends come up from Orlando, and they visited for 10 days. And, and the thing that they just kept saying is, oh, my gosh, everybody's so nice here. And I think when you move to the rural areas, you, you don't – you might run into that person later that day or tomorrow or the next week. So you, you're automatically just a kinder person because – you now know this person. They're in your community. Um, you could have no morals, and you're still going to be nicer to that person because if you're not, you're going to get run out of town because you're going to see them again. Where, like in Orlando, who cares? You may never see anybody again. You flip them the bird. You know that was everybody's mentality there. So moving to Montana, to Idaho, to the American Redoubt, you really go into a place with not only like-minded liberty lovers, but also people that are just—they're going to be kind. You may have different beliefs, different, diff, you know, different political views. But you're going to be in a group of people that are just going to treat each other better, and like you said, be more self-reliant. Yeah, we see that here too. Everyone waves at each other when when they when they drive by. It's kind of weird when you first go into that environment. You're like, why is a guy waving at me? Right. So, you know, but that's how it is in, in in the in the rural areas, and that's it's that way in like the hill country of Tennessee or Texas. Yeah. It's that way any upstate New York. It's much like Montana. So all across the country, I would I would advocate seriously if you can move to a more rural area. It is a big difference, and it's going to make a big difference when the crap hits the fan as far as your 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 cohesion of your community. So, so you're talking about the crap hitting the fan. I think a lot of preppers or a lot of survivalists would look at this and say, okay, I think that there's uh, a few different scenarios. Um, what do you think is most likely and, and what kind of time frame do you think we have? It's always an interesting question. I think, I think the most likely one is the most obvious one is an economic ticking time bomb. Um, our currency now is, is, is a fiat currency that's been so it's – already, it's already too far. It's already gone so far you can't save it. Yeah. It's going to die. As, as Brandon points out, he writes on economics, it's either they're going to keep the printing presses running and then they, they, they kill the dollar by, through hyperinflation, or they don't and you wind up with a default, which also kills the dollar. So eventually the, world, the world's already decoupling from the dollar. China is setting up all these bilateral trade agreements with other countries, Russia, the BRIC nations, you know, Brazil, Russia, um, it's a Brazil, Russia... China, what's the other one? India. I was going to say anyway. India, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and they keep adding. Now they got a, they, got a, they have a bilateral trade agreement now with Australia and China. So now wow. Australia and China, whenever they do trade, they don't use dollars anymore. They use their own currencies. They use the yuan in particular. And so the world's already decoupling from the dollar, and China is essentially setting itself up to be the new U.S., the new manufacturing, and also the new um, domestic market for imports, too. A, a large, both. They're doing what we used to do. And so, you know, the dollars days are numbered, we know that, and so we have to realize that, look, 
it's going to die eventually. When it does, it's going to go down like either Weimar Germany or like in Argentina back in 2001. You can look at those you know, very recent, relatively recent historical examples of what happens. And a big point that I like to make is uh, there's a good book called When Money Dies about written by a guy named Ferguson, about the, the Weimar Republic collapse, about the hyperinflation in Weimar Germany and Austria and Hungary too. And he talks about how even when there was food, and even when the farms still had food growing, they stopped shipping it to the cities because they had no reason to. What's the point in shipping your, your valuable produce to the cities to exchange for worthless marks? So they just kept the food and uh. ate it themselves or they just traded it among themselves and so the city folks had to travel out into the country with bags full of, of the family silver and the family piano, the grand piano, and trade it for a, a bag of potatoes. So that's the reality. Even when you have food, it, it might not get to market because there's just no point in doing it. So that's interesting. We have, we have to realize that this is where we're headed. And in contrast to the 1920s and 30s in this country, where most people lived on farms or lived in you know, rural communities, in, in sharp contrast, the great majority of Americans now live in cities. And so we see it as a strategic deficit. We've got a weakness that's, that's on a magnitude of what would happen in the wake of, of, a, of a nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. I mean, back during the Cold War, we had three years worth of grain reserve. The U.S. government maintained three years worth of grain to feed the American people all through the 1950s when they were worried about a, a nuclear exchange. And now we have nothing. We've got no grain reserve. Last I checked, we had enough for a half a loaf of bread for each one of us. That was all they had in reserve. Are you kidding me? Right. And so we had, you know, so they saw the, the necessity because we realized that after a nuclear exchange, it might take three years to regrow the crops. Well, now, if economic collapse, you should, you should see it as kind of like an economic neutron bomb. It'll kill the people, leave the infrastructure, and but you're still wind up in the same situation. You don't have the capacity to feed yourself. You don't have a reserve. And so if you have a, a catastrophic collapse, you could see the same kind of massive die-off as you would at a nuclear exchange. Makes me and think so, it's almost more important to have three years worth of food than just one year. Yeah, uh, definitely. But, I mean, the, but the big, big message for preppers is, guys, you know, you having food for you is great for you and your family. Yeah. But... That is not going to help you when your neighbors are starving and your whole community collapses and you're not providing. The essential things you have to have for life is food and security and, of course, clean water you know, and then shelter. But in that hierarchy, you've got to have, you gotta have food. Shelter you can improvise. Water you can probably improvise. But food is difficult to improvise. You're going to hunt out all the deer. You're going to you know, strip the bark off the trees. You're not going to have enough food to feed your community. And so the, the hard reality is, is that our government no longer has a reserve for us. They're not preparing to feed us. They're preparing mm. to control us or to shoot us. They're storing up millions of dollars worth of ammunition and MRAPs, but they're not storing up food. So that tells you their perspective. Yeah. And so we, the American people, are going to have to take it upon ourselves to do our own strategic grain reserve, our own food reserve. And that means storing food for your neighbors, too. Even if you're mad at them for not being, for being idiots or not, <laughs> aren't seeing what's going on, again, it's not going to help you when they're starving to death because when they're starving to death, they will accept martial law. They will accept even foreign intervention into your community. They will accept whatever heavy-handed stuff comes down from Washington, D.C., because they'll be desperate for the food. That's so if you don't want them to do that, you better provide for that yourselves. That's a really deep and heavy point that I think is, is almost worth repeating. I mean, for people out there listening to this right now or watching it on YouTube or Vimeo or wherever we, we post this, um, really think about that. If you are preparing for yourself and your family, but your neighborhood isn't preparing at all and they're going to starve, uh, you should really be tithing your 10% to a food reserve for the community. Um, yep. You know, my brother's basically, he's setting up a really nice area to feed his entire street. Um, because he realizes the, the value in that, and I think it's something to really think long and hard about. If you only get one thing out of this presentation today, think about that, and uh, and what can you do now to make a difference? Because a lot of guys can't afford to buy the extra food, so maybe start a, a permaculture garden or whatever you can. Um, Stuart, I'm getting some questions coming in here from some of our listeners. Uh, one of them says um, uh, he wants to know how to reach those neutral officers and convince them 
Um, and what's been your most effective method for doing that? As far as, I guess, to keep their, their oath, um, how do you reach like-minded officers or like-minded um, law enforcement? Um, I think I think the best wedge in is, is the gun issue. Most of them are pro-gun. Most of them are into guns. And that's the one issue that they're more likely to be able to see clearly the problem. And, and Katrina is a star example. We had... You know, you had orders to confiscate firearms from peaceable Americans who were just trying to protect themselves and their property, and you had police officers obeying these orders. And I think, uh, you know, if the guy can't see that as a problem, then he's probably a lost cause and not really worth worth your time. So that's a really good first issue to bring up <laughs> and say, look, here's what happened during Katrina. Um, our concern is, is we want to make sure it doesn't happen again. And we want to make sure that a right to bear arms is not violated. Not because it's more important than the rest of the Bill of Rights. They're all equally important. But it's the one issue I think you're going to have the best success reaching them about. And so then you can, like you did, hypothetical is they pass an assault weapons ban nationwide. Um, will you assist in the enforcement of it here locally? You know, will you will you refuse to do that under your under your obligations under your oath? And then he can bring up Nuremberg. You know, look, you know, the Nazis at Nuremberg defended themselves by saying they were just following orders. It's no defense. Yeah. It's not a valid defense. And so and you, you're kind of educating them while you're talking to them. I would, I'd like to presume the best. I don't want to go up to a cop and say, you know, you're part of an uh, abusive regime that's violating our rights, and all you are is a tool for the man. That's, you don't want to do that. What right. you want to say is, look, you took an oath. I know that you, you, you why did you become a cop? Yeah. Most of them will say, I became a cop to be a protector, to be the shield. And you can say, okay, well, look at what our Declaration of Independence says. Your obligation is to defend not just our life and our property, but also our liberty, life, liberty, and, and property pursuit of happiness. So your goal and obligation is to protect our rights first and foremost. And you took that oath. And what's the point of government is to secure these rights. And just kind of bring them back to that original original thought. It's not to enforce, that's why we don't like the term law enforcement, it's not to enforce whatever the politico has put in place. Okay. It's to secure our liberty. And, and the further away they get from those core functions, protecting you against rape, robbery, and murder, the more they get into, you know, malum prohibitum, we don't like it because we don't like it stuff, that's where they get further afield from their actual their actual, you know, the core of their responsibility and duty. So just remind them what their what their purpose is. They are protectors, not abusers, not violators, and not blind enforcers, you know. I think that's a great answer. You know, let's jump back to something that might be a little bit more controversial. Uh, looking at Katrina, there were a lot of people that didn't keep their oath and they went in to confiscate guns. For a lot of Americans, gun confiscation is a very clear line in the sand. At yeah. what point, as American citizens, whether you're law enforcement, army, retired, uh, or just an average citizen of, of the United States of America, at what point is it your duty to take on the, the, the role of defending yourself and shooting people that are coming to take away your life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness, that are there breaking breaking the Constitution um, and putting you at risk. At what point does somebody have the, the moral and legal justification to use lethal force to defend themselves from, in that case, um, oath breakers? Well, you, you, you cannot allow yourselves to be disarmed. And, and this is the lesson, you know, the founders understood that also. They had put up with a long train of abuses over decades, but it was the attempt to disarm them that, that finally was the last straw because they realized if we allow ourselves to be disarmed, we'll have no recourse. And so it is a, a pretty clear line in the sand. Now, individually with your family and you're, you got facing a SWAT team in the middle of the night, it might be your best option at that moment is not to fight back and get your whole family killed. Um, but you certainly cannot allow yourselves to be disarmed as a community. And so it's going to be a strategy question about, it's, it's not a moral question, it's a strategy question about where you how, you, how you do this, how do you resist. Like, look at the guys in New York right now, in Connecticut. We have members in New York and Connecticut who are just not going to comply with that stuff. They're not going to go register themselves like sex offenders. They've already declared, and we've declared as an organization, we will not register ourselves or our arms. Yeah. And I think that's an important point. And so now, then the question is, well, now what? 
and, and I guess the, the shortest answer is don't make it easy on them. Don't make it easy on Cuomo to throw you away, you know, throw you in prison and throw away the key. Make it tougher on them. It doesn't mean you comply. It just means you're smart about how you resist. And you do what you can to get the police to do the right thing and not enforce it. But man, you know, New York is a powder keg right now. It really is. Because there are a lot of gun owners who have just said, that's it, I'm done. I'm not going to register myself and I'm not going to submit to being incarcerated and arrested and incarcerated for something that's not a crime. This is this is ridiculous, you know. And so it is a powder keg. And the only safety valve I can think of there is for the, the veterans and the gun owners to, to contact directly with the police and get them to understand what a powder keg it is and get them to back off and not enforce it. Let Cuomo go do it himself. Or okay. let him and his select squads try to go do it. And, th and the next step is, is that it's much better for you to organize around a constitutional sheriff and have a nice strong posse in your county. And then the sheriff stands up and says, Hey, Highway Patrol, or hey, Cuomo's Goon Squads, you're not going to do that in my county, or I'm going to stop you. And then now you've got the sheriff backed up by the community, you're in the strongest position. So if you're going to, if you're looking at the prospect of having to resist um, violations of the Second Amendment or any other, other part of the Bill of Rights, it's much better if you do it as a community. It takes a community, it takes a village, it takes a village to stop the secret police. Yeah. Rather than just, you know, because. You know, look at the bottom line about this. What happened throughout history is you see people like Solzhenitsyn, the famous uh, Russian dissident. He talks about how, you know, his famous quote about how he burned in the camps later, wondering what things would have been like if we had realized the full situation and realized we had nothing to lose by fighting back and set up an ambush together against the secret police. And so they, and so instead of being isolated individuals who are waiting and, and for the knock in the middle of the night, you are organizing as a community with, for community defense. You're in a much stronger position. There's not enough secret police. There's not enough, you know, hired mercenaries, Blackwater or XE or whatever. There's not enough of them to come into your community and, and take you away in the middle of the night if you're organized as a community. Yeah. So the more organized you are as a community, the stronger you are. And that's the lesson of the founders. They didn't try to rely only on the Sons of Liberty and secret cells. They organized very public militias. And so when General Gage wanted to go and, and, and go to Concord, which was now the seat of the rebel government, basically, that's the political seat of, of, the, of the, the Patriot shadow government was now Concord. And he took over Boston under martial law. That's why John Adams was there or Sam Adams. That's why Sam Adams was in Concord. That's why Hancock was in Concord. That was the new seat of, of the resistance. But they organized very public defenses. And so Gage couldn't just go in with a goon squad in the middle of the night and black bag Hancock and Adams. He had to send a whole friggin military unit to go do this and to seize the arms. And that forced him to show his hand and take off the mask and be the overt oppressor. It forced him to, to, to seek out the rebels on their territory with force. And he still got his ass kicked. And he got his ass kicked by a community. It was a community that chased Pitcairn and all his Marines back to Boston with their tail between their legs. It wasn't a secret cell. So the message to all you secret cell preppers and three percenters out there who think you're going to be able to do it with a three-man secret cell is that's not going to kick the secret police's ass. What's going to kick their ass is a community. It almost sounds when, to me like you're advocating a, or at least opening my eyes, I maybe not advocating it, but opening my eyes to the idea of having a secondary political system that we start now. We start yesterday. We start today. And that political system involves your local sheriff and people that that are awake. And you form a, a very tight political system within the messed up political system so that you've got that team in place um, right. for what I believe when martial law comes down, when uh, tyrannical government tries to confiscate weapons. Um, it, yeah. Am I understanding kind of right? Absolutely. And this is the founder's model again. You know, they had a malicious system in which they used both. They, it was a yin and yang kind of thing. They had a very public malicious system was every able-bodied male in the community 
And so a, a list of dissidents will do you no good when the entire community is on that list. The list becomes friggin' useless. So Gage had to deal with a, a public body of organized and armed men, and that forced him. He couldn't just do it, like I said, with a handful of, of officers go arrest the, the leaders. He had to send in an entire military unit to do it. And so the modern counterpart is that when you have an organized public militia or sheriff's posse or other community defense, call it whatever you want to call it, when you have every able-bodied male and even female organized for mutual defense, they can't do it with secret police. That forces them to try to use the National Guard or the Army or the U.S. Marine Corps. And now they have to rely on guys that, that are not well-vetted, trust, trusted you know, obedient enforcers. Getting the U.S. Marine Corps to come invade your community and oppress you will be a lot trickier and riskier for them than relying on a small handful of, of DHS or FBI or whatever, or your local SWAT team. So if you have an organized community that's organized in mutual aid and defense, it strips away their ability to operate like that. They have to now take the mask all the way off and try to use a standing army against you. So it really and, starts with your sheriff. And the big question mark is a huge question mark about what would happen then. Yeah. The, I can tell you, quite a few guys inside the Army and Marine Corps would not just say, hell no, but they would turn on their, their, their guys giving them the orders. They would. Yeah. There would be a lot of friggin' fragging going on. And wow. so that makes them worry about And they are worried about that. They are friggin' worried about that. Which is probably why DHS is being formed, right? <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, they, they, they want you to be afraid to organize publicly. They prefer that you be afraid. So that's the whole point of the NSA spying on us, is to chill us and make us afraid to organize. Um, so the founders, look at the wisdom of the founders. They had very public militias, but they also had the Sons of, of Liberty, which was their secret organization. They used both strategies. And I think we should look at the same thing. We you do what you can to use whatever's there as a community, but you also have your own personal, you know, plan B, C, and D of my own personal security is no one else's business. I might have my own contingency plans, my own safe houses set up, whatever, but you still have a public. So you have both strategies, very public, but also your own personal private stuff that's no one else's business, need to know only. No. So use both. Now, before almost every battle or war... We sound so subversive, though. We're just getting really, really kind of far down the line into hardcore, it, you know... It is. Well, it's, and it's... I apologize. It's, it's stuff that nobody wants to talk about, and you seem um, extremely educated in this area, and that's a problem with... One of my main problems um, is our education system right now. You know, I'm 30. I didn't learn about this stuff, so I'm spending my time now interviewing guys that did learn about it and trying to learn through... Through everybody. Um, uh, one, one more question here, and then we'll jump back on track. Uh, this is a question that came in from another one of our listeners here. Um, how to wake up officers who really never thought of the need to possibly not comply one day? Um, and I and let's tie that into your new program you're working with um, and, and segue into that. Well, all right, I'm going to be blunt about this. I'm going to tell you that when it comes to outreach to police officers the focus should be on your sheriff number one because when he if you get your sheriff to understand his OFA obligations and I really recommend that you introduce your sheriff to CSPOA you know, Sheriff Max organization the Constitutional Sheriff's and Peace Officer Association it's kind of a sister organization to Oath Keepers uh, that focuses on the sheriffs and focuses on the police okay. the, the, the greatest lion's share of your effort when it comes to cops should be on your sheriff because he is elected representative of the people. He can't be purged out. A police chief can be fired by the local town council or the mayor. And so it's much less likely you're going to get a police chief who will stand up. Just human nature being what it is. Doesn't mean you forsake them or don't try, but I would put the most focus on the sheriff and the sheriff's deputies and then work your way down the, you know, the, the hierarchy. Than the, than the than the local uh, PD, um, but a lot of police in this country are beyond reach. Just the reality of it. So many of them have been so indoctrinated, whether it's through the drug war or now the war on terror, 
they're so used to working with the feds and they're, they've got this mentality like you like you experienced of well I enforce the law whatever the law is I enforce it it's my job so yeah. it's really hard to break through that and so don't put all your eggs in that one basket is kind of what I'm saying you know okay. understand going in that you're not going to be able to reach them all you you treat them with respect and you give them the benefit of a doubt but you can't mince words you gotta say look man when the push push comes to shove in this community it's not just about your pension whether you lose your pension part of the equation is also going to be whether or not you are seen as our enemies and, and the enemies of the people and, and the enemies of gun owners in particular in this and the veterans in this community think about that we don't want to have to kill you someday, we don't <laughs> want to fight you. A, you know, a, I mean, this. You know, it, it's it's yeah. it's always a judgment calling talking to a police officer, but that's why I prefer to have my retired cops talk to the current serving cops. Then they can say, "Look, I've been there. I understand where you're at." But the the when you're looking at all the things that are in play here, it's not just whether you lose your job; it's also down the road whether or not you're going to come home at night. And that's not to threaten them. It's just to point out a reality that we're heading down that road, and it's only so far you can push people. Yeah, I know some combat vets from Vietnam who are—they've already—they're old. They just don't—they give none. They give no f's. You know, they don't care anymore. The only thing restraining them is their own conscience. It's not a concern for their own lives, and so police officers need to understand that there are people like that out there who are very good at violence. And they're not doing anything out of a moral check on themselves. But if you cross too many lines, you cross those real hard, bright lines, like black bagging veterans and putting in military detention, enforcing martial law, they're going to kill you. They're going to kill you. And it's not they might try and they will just little fail. No, they're going to kill you. And so I think a lot of cops don't understand that. They don't understand that. Just because they have been safe so far in enforcing laws that we consider to be unconstitutional doesn't mean that's how it's going to always be. They've got normalcy bias about their own invincibility, and it's a paper tiger. Yeah. As General Gage's troops found out April 19, 1775, when you face a community that finally rises up, look at what's going on in Michoacan, Mexico. Let's just divorce ourselves from the context of, of posse fighting our own cops. Look at what's going on in Michoacan, Mexico. The, the Templar cartel tyrannized the people of Michoacan for years until they finally just had enough. Hmm. Then they rose up en masse and kicked the cartel's ass. And now the Mexican government has to negotiate with this, this new element of the people in arms. They can't just go in there and run rush shot over them because they're like, hey, we're not going to disarm. There's no friggin' way we're going to leave ourselves um, defenseless against the cartels. We're, we'll fight you first. And so now they've had to reconcile with them. Hmm. So there's an example of a community. There, the bottom line is, is there are more good guys than bad guys. And when the bad guys push the good guys far enough and the good guys realize their strength, then they see that they're really paper tigers. So the cartel cannot crush this community when they rise up. And neither can the secret police. And neither can the local SWAT team. The local SWAT team, like here where I live in Montana, the local SWAT team here is vastly outnumbered by us veterans. And so if a push came to shove, their life expectancy would be like maybe three or four days. So, so you know, but I don't want to, it's not about threatening them. It's just look at saying, look, guys, do what's right because it's right. But also understand that if you go down that road, this is not Russia, this is not China. You will face resistance here, and you might think that because we haven't done it yet, that we will never will. This is what the British thought, too. They thought, because Americans have put up with so much crap, that they would never fight back. Hmm. And then they got their asses handed them. So it can go like that. When the powder keg goes, it just goes. It's pretty powerful so anyway. to hear somebody in your position say that, because you know a lot of guys, when you start kind of getting into the preparedness, survivalist, self-reliance movement... You get guys that they have an ego, like, oh, I'm just going to kill the mother effer. And that's not a reality. You're, you'll die. Um, but like you're saying, strategically organizing as a group, safety in numbers, you really start to paint a clear picture that 
the government was set up the way it was because it was we the people. We control you uh, instead of the government controlling the people. And, and like the Gadsden flag, you know, uh, you can get pretty close. You can maybe even harass us a little bit. And then at some point, um, we'll kill you. I think that's a, a pretty a pretty interesting, um, just just interesting insight, hearing it the way you, you lay it out. I think it, it opens people's eyes a lot to to make them think a lot more. Uh, we did a, a great interview. Um, we, we just hosted a big thing called the Survival Summit. It was a week-long event online. One of the interviews we did was with Travis Haley. And he was saying, you know, thinkers before shooters was everything that, that his presentation was about. And, and what you're saying goes right along with that. And, you know, think first um, and organize. So on the topic of organizing, you've got a new thing with Oath Keepers. Um, you've been very successful with getting your name out, your brand out. Um, I've I've seen your billboards out in front of police base or uh, not police base um, uh, military bases. So obviously you're doing a great job. How can you reach then civilians or small groups of people um, with the new program you guys have been developing and working on? Well, we started now as we call a CPT program, and originally it was civilization preservation teams. We're probably going to change the name to community preparedness teams because our guys in the field have given us feedback that's easier to approach their local community with. But the whole idea is for um, Oath Keepers to form these teams and what they really are is a training cadre. What we'd like to see is community neighborhood watches and especially the veterans organizations organize themselves as a civil defense unit for the community. So we're telling our guys is look we'll start a 12-man team as a, as a model and you can say okay based on the Special Forces A-Team model where you have a 12-man squad but you've got in that squad you've got two communications experts two medical experts and two engineers and so you have the ability to be somewhat self-sufficient and also to help provide a community with that critical infrastructure a lot of guys think about guns but they don't think about combo and medical and engineering you gotta have communications. You don't have communications, you ain't got jack. Yeah. You gotta have medical support and you gotta have your engineering. You gotta have clean water, you gotta have power, you gotta have bridges, you gotta have wells, things like that. And so what an SFA team does is they'll go into a community, like and say they're going in um, to help gorillas. They'll go in and, and what they do is they're a force multiplier. They go in there and they organize the community and teach them and make them stronger. That's what we're encouraging our guys to do. See themselves as a training cadre. You've got veterans who have amazing experience and, and, and training so why not use that go into the community and they could be the trainers to help grow the community defense but the real goal is to get all the veterans and all the VFWs, American Legions, Marine Corps League all those organizations to see themselves as a unit when you go into a VFW like here in Montana my local VFW is 500 guys Wow, that's a battalion <laughs> that's a lot of people and so if, if you can get that VFW to see themselves as already being a unit, they already got a building, they got officers, they got money, but what are they doing with it? Most of the time they're, they're drinking beers. So if you can get them to see themselves as a unit, understand their, their oath obligations to defend their community, and they form as the civil defense unit, to me that's the ideal. So when it comes to, we look at it like two pillars going up. The one side is, is what can you do outside of government? And that's the the volunteer associations, neighborhood watch, most important. Ground zero is, do you have a neighborhood watch in your neighborhood? If you don't have a neighborhood watch, you got no business going to Washington, D.C. and waving signs or doing anything else. you got to get a neighborhood watch established around your local neighborhood. Your family is your first team. Like inside your family, do you have medical, commo, and engineering? Like I'm going to EMT school. My son's getting his ham license. You know, we're, we're making sure that we've got those critical skills in our own family, but the next step is our neighborhood. And we do have a neighborhood watch where we live. So, and so you need to establish, call it whatever you want, the neighborhood association, whatever. You form up a neighborhood watch and get your neighbors on board, at least to a limited degree. And, and there, think about, you might not get everybody in your neighborhood who wakes up and sees the reality of what's going on and prepares. But you should put in place those critical things that are hard to improvise. Medical is hard to improvise. Either you got it or you don't. Communications, emergency communications is hard to improvise. Either you got radios and antennas and batteries or you don't. Emergency power is hard to improvise. Same thing. So 
get that stuff squared mm -hmm. away. At least have a core of the critical things you're going to need during an emergency, and then you can improvise. You can improvise defense. Most guys got guns. You can improvise neighborhood security and defense. So that's so. See yourselves as kind of the nucleus. Try to find the folks in your neighborhood who have those critical skills to at least have a skeleton crew of the core infrastructure and leadership you're going to need. And then, the, of course, the other big thing you cannot improvise is food. So that's where bags of rice and beans come in and oatmeal. It's cheap, guys. $20, I think, for a 50-pound bag of wheat or rice and beans. Rice and beans are good because all you need is hot water. Rice and beans and oatmeal. If you just had rice and beans and oatmeal stored up for your neighbors, you're doing a lot better. So that's the big thing. Make sure you've got that critical infrastructure. So you, your family, your neighborhood, next one out, this is all outside of government. Next one out is your church and your veterans organizations. If you can get your local church to also see their responsibility, every church should be like the LDS church. You don't have to be a Mormon to store food. Every church needs to be like that. All of them need to be doing that. If your pastor is not organizing for community uh, support like that within the church, he's not doing his job. And then, then the veterans halls. And, and you know, among all those things, if I could focus on two, it'd be the neighborhood watch and a local veterans hall. Because imagine if, like here in Montana, we've got a couple hundred VFW halls. And every state's like that. You've got several hundred VFW halls. Imagine if every VFW hall saw themselves as a unit and had their commo squared away. Just picture commo alone. Now you have an emergency network of communications all across the state. And then they also got their medical squared away. They all got friggin' medics in there, but do they have the stuff they need? So so we go into the VFW halls, get them to see their, their responsibilities and see themselves as a unit. And even without government permission, you've already got a big change in the strength of your community right there. And on the public side, that's where you've got sheriff's posse, a good sheriff with a sheriff's posse is ground zero. But I would also encourage all of you, volunteer fire, search and rescue, um, even FEMA cert teams, go and whatever's there, join it, make it stronger. If you don't have a search and rescue unit, start one. If you don't have a sheriff's posse, start one. I think those are great tips. Um, now, for guys that are, are not ex-military or active duty um, and they want to go into a VFW to help organize, what, what approach would you suggest? Because for somebody like myself, I study this stuff, but I'm, I've never been in combat. I hope to never be in combat. Um, what kind of tip would you give to somebody like me who wants to go help uh, the local veterans organize and become a stronger community? Well, the, the, the easiest way to do it is it's better if you have a veteran go talk to the vet. It's much easier if you got a guy who's already in the VFW. Okay. Like last night I was on a call with our guys in Washington State. One of the guys on the call is, is a local commander of his local VFW. That's the guy who you want to be the point man to go talk to all the VFWs in your state, if you can. Okay. So preferably get a guy who's already a member of the VFW. That's why you want to you want to form a team. That's, that's the whole point of forming a team. When you form a team, it, like our teams, every guy doesn't have to be prior service. We've got people who you know, grew up doing construction. They're really good. At, that's those are engineers. It can be a guy who has, you know, civilian experience. It's really priceless. But when you're going to go talk to a veteran, it's much easier for veterans to talk to veterans and cops to talk to cops. So ideally, you come together as a community and you say, okay, let's form a team of outreach. And this outreach team, you know, Joe's a retired cop. That's who goes and talks to the sheriff. Uh, Barney's a friggin' retired, you know, marine. That's who goes and talks to the VFW commander. Ideally, if you don't have that. Then you can just walk in and say, you know, hey, I just want to let you know that I'm a prepper here locally. I think preparedness is important. Uh, we'd like to, you know, work with the veterans in community preparedness. You do what you can, but it's much easier if you have a veteran do it. It just, it just is. But I think you know? that makes sense. Shared experience matters. It does. What kind of advice so, could you give to somebody who has um, listened to the propaganda, you know, before every major war or battle, the, the opposite, you know, whatever invading team usually spreads leaflets and propaganda. And I think we are receiving that now from our government with the DHS uh, buildup of arms and tanks, uh, with right. the, the massive ammo buy, with the NSA spying and nothing being done about it. We are now being leafleted. <laughs> you know, we're kind of getting this. So there's a lot of hesitation from guys. They don't want to be on the SPLC. They don't want to be on extremist lists and 
uh, or, or government watch lists, and we kind of joke about it on the show a lot, like if you're not on the terrorist watch list, it's because you're not being politically active. Um, you're and, not doing your job, right. right. Yeah, and it's a, sad, um, it's a sad reality. Well, it goes back to my earlier point, is, is that they, they want you to be afraid to organize. Imagine, put yourself in Barack Obama's chair or Eric Holder's chair or John McCain's chair for that matter, looking at the American people, would they prefer that you, which would they rather see you do? Be afraid to organize public posses and neighborhood watches and civil defense units and militias? Or would they prefer that you not do all those things? I mean, do, do, do they want you to do those things or not? The answer is, of course, they don't. They don't want to worry about going into a community and facing every on 500 men in that local VFW or 1,000 gun owners all organized with ham radios who can respond. They don't want that. They want you to be isolated in your house so they can come in using the local SWAT team. That's what they prefer to do. Use a local SWAT team as their force multiplier and stick machine guns in your, in your face, in your, in your wife and kid's face in the middle of the night while you're in your underwear. That's what they right. prefer. What they don't want is to face a Concord or Lexington scenario of the whole community all around them coming up because they'll get their asses kicked and they know it. So do what they don't want. They don't want you to organize, so friggin' organize. How but organize, that? like I said, if you make the list so big the list becomes useless. Right. If you're all on the list because you're all in the local sheriff's posse behind a good sheriff, what are they going to do now? now? Look at our pile down in Arizona. You know, I don't like some things he's done in the past, but one thing he's done right is he's got a 3,000-man posse, and the feds can't just go arrest Arpaio in the middle of the night, can they? Right. they got to worry about 3,000 people all around him. And some of those guys, I talked to his, you know, his search and rescue guys, all carry M4s, and they're all very well trained. That's yeah. light infantry. Yeah. So if you've got an organized community like that, of, of several hundred or a thousand people organized, game changer. So they don't want you to do that. They want you to be afraid. And frankly, when they get you to self-censor, where you're afraid to post something online, afraid to speak your mind, they now have psychologically defeated you. You might as well just mail in your friggin' balls. Because you're, you're, if you won't stand up now, you're not going to stand up someday as a secret squirrel freedom fighter. It's very unlikely. Unless you're some retired Marine scout sniper who's some serious, real deal badass, then you're fooling yourself if you think you're going to be some kind of secret squirrel freedom fighter. I would say use both strategies. Organize very publicly, but then have your fallback plans and, and your worst case scenarios. They're coming for you. You've got to get out of your house. Where are you going to go? That kind of thing. Do them both. I think that's, that's great. How can people... Um find more about Oath Keepers and, and become part of your your group, your organization, and help make a difference here? Well, a big point, you can just go to OathKeepers.org, but a big point is is that we're not trying to get everyone to join Oath Keepers. If you're a, a veteran in a local VFW, the most important thing, for example, is for you to get your VFW squared away. The VFW hall already exists. It's not about us forming a new organization and, and you have to come join us. You're more than welcome to, but most important is, do you have a neighborhood watch? Do you have your local veterans hall awake and aware? Do you have a sheriff's posse? None of those require you to be an Oath Keeper member. Now, if you do want to join Oath Keepers, you're more than welcome to, and we have associate membership available for those who are not prior service. Um, if someone's an a EMT or a volunteer firefighter, they would qualify for full membership. And even if they're not and they just want to help out, they can join as an associate. And we don't really care. Once you join, no one really cares what you've done in the past. We're all in this together. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we welcome anybody to help us out. But I want to make it clear that it's not about us trying to grow organization. What's most important is do you have, you have, have your community squared away? And we're here to help. In every chapter in our states, we we're forming these CPT teams. And the most important part of it is for them to be a training cadre and to go go teach. And so you can plug in, you can email us, we'll put you in touch with your, with your point of contact in your state, and they're more than happy to come out and teach classes and, and, and come in and give a presentation on how to do it. They're there to help you. Very cool. Now, last thought on that for, for people like, uh, let's say I want to be one of those 
those people are like, reach out to you guys. I, I get the contact for community organ for a community organizer. Then I want to go put on a meeting someplace. Where would you suggest people have these types of meetings? Like, are there public halls that are that people have free access to rather than going to somebody's home? How would they find a location? Yeah, I would I would I would recommend one of the if a guy wants to start a chapter, one of the first things you can do is is go to a gun show, get a booth at a gun show, and then at a Perkins restaurant or a Denny's or whatever, a lot of times they'll let you reserve a room but with a closed door so you can have a meeting, and all you gotta do is eat. And it's it's a free meeting place. All you gotta do is everyone pays for their own food, and so you set that up in advance. You go to the gun show, maybe it costs you thirty bucks for a table. You say, hey, you have you have flyers on the table that say our next meeting is gonna be, you know, three days later, Wednesday night or whatever. It will be our first meeting here, establishing an Oath Keeper chapter. We are looking for people to be on these teams. We're looking for medical, engineering. We're looking for communications people. We're looking for light infantry skills. We're looking for all these skills, food storage, whatever it is. And so you're recruiting and you're shopping for skills. Hmm. And you're, you know, while you're there in in the in the uh, in the local gun, you know, gun hall for, during the gun show, you, you're talking to a guy. What did you do? You know, if your prior service, what, you, what was your MOS? You know, you're getting an idea of what they did. And I would say, okay, here's our flyer for our next meeting. If you'd like to be on our free email alert system, just give me your email. Whatever you're comfortable giving me is fine. First name basis is fine too. They don't got to give you your full name, but just say, "Hey, we're looking for guys on these teams. If you're willing to join a, an Oathkeeper team, you're more than welcome to. Come in here, and we'll, we'll put you we'll put you to work. If they don't want to do that, fine. Just come to our meeting. They can they can be a secret squirrel and just come to the meeting and learn. That's fine too. So whatever they want to do, we don't want guys to feel like we're trying to gather their names for a list. Right. So if a guy doesn't want to be part of a public team, fine. He can go organize him and his pals as a secret team if they want to. I don't care. So, but anyway, point is that you can you can get a free room at a lot of these restaurants, or maybe your local VFW. They might charge you like fifty bucks or whatever. But that's okay. So the best way to do it is put up flyers in the gun shops and the pawn shops and wherever guys go and buy their outdoor gear. And they'll let you put a flyer up. A gun show is great. Those are the best ways to do it. And start a chapter out. And, and you gave me an idea. It reminded me of something. Uh, we did an interview almost a year ago now with a guy who created a product called Civil Defense, uh, or no, excuse me, Civil Dispatch. And it's essentially a, a mass text messaging system. So one of the ideas that, that you may want to incorporate or for guys listening that want to do this themselves, um, it's uh, Civil Dispatch, I think, dot com. And you put in people's cell numbers. You don't even have to know their name. And you can say, hey, Johnny's in trouble at this address. Uh, we need we need EMT. We need uh, uh, you know fire team. We need whatever, um, and it's a way to organize events without um, you know without having to worry about sending papers or maybe being in person. But if you have to organize quickly to respond to an emergency, you know somebody's house is being invaded or robbed, or somebody's house is burning down, um, or someone's having a heart attack and needs help in the hospital. So it would be a, a way possibly to tie in with what you're doing. To get people to, uh, right. to be, have access to responding quickly, right? But I would also re I would also use ham radio too and CBs. So you want to use stuff that will be there when the cell towers go down. Yes. So ham is pretty good. Yeah. And, and, and the ham operators already have a network. They're already they're already used to doing this stuff. So yeah. you want to plug into your your existing ham network if you can. Yeah. yeah. And this does so, tie so. into ham radio. They've got a they've got a way to do that. Which uh, I'm not a ham radio expert, so. <laughs> I'm not either. Right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, so that's that's the thing is is you you do you do want to pick one. It's kind of like a Chinese menu. I <laughs> I encourage all of you to to pick one, pick a specialty. Whether it's going to be engineering, medical, commo, uh, maybe if you're on the support side, it might be food storage. It might be motor pool and transport. You know, whatever it is, if you're a good mechanic. It's, and I mean, this is the thing is that you don't have to be a young, fit, you know infantryman type guy who can go out there and run around in the woods you can also be somebody who's really good at like you know growing food or really good at repairing things that's going to be important too but put together a, a cohesive team what we have is we have a 12 man field team and then we have a support side that could be as big as it needs to be to support that field team and that's our model and I know we talked a lot about resistance but another big important part of this is being the first responder and in infrastructure for your community so that you don't have desperate neighbors who then, like in Katrina, 
can't take care of themselves, cannot take care of each other, and they go along with unconstitutional stuff. And the big point of this is that if you are squared away as a community, providing your own security, your own emergency medical and food and whatnot and shelter, it takes away this, the urgency. And under those circumstances, it's much easier then to get the police and military to say no to the unconstitutional orders. Because they're human beings too. If they perceive it as being a bad enough emergency, a lot of them will go along with stuff that they wouldn't go along with if you were squared away. So what you want is for them to look around and go, well, wait a minute, you know, they've got it handled, they don't need our help, they don't want our help, why are you ordering me to go in there and disarm these people? So you want to remove the sense of emergency. So, you know, and, and of course we all know just tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, ice storms, all of that, the local infrastructure of police and emergency response is always overwhelmed. They cannot handle it just yeah. the way it is. And so you have to be there as a community to handle it yourselves. There's no such thing as a free lunch. If you give up that personal responsibility to take care of yourselves, you're going to either be starved to death or die, yeah. or you're going to have somebody come in and, and tell you what's what. So. Yeah. Now, it, my I guess as we kind of wrap this up, one of my final thoughts is, you know, it seems like this is so obvious to go back to keeping your oath, um, to going back to the Constitution, yet it seems like such a challenge for a lot of people because of outside influence of, oh, you're one of those guys, you are you think the world's coming to an end, or any last advice or thoughts you could give to somebody with going back to the roots and, and maybe saying, forget about the outside influence or, or the, the propaganda, you know, what, what tips would you give somebody who's maybe on the edge about getting involved with something like this? I would say that the founding fathers expected you to be the militia. You're supposed to be the military security force for your community and your state. They expected you to be the sheriff's posse. You are supposed to be the law enforcement in your area. They expected you to be the volunteer fire department. You know, Ben Franklin started a volunteer fire department. Most of them, John Adams was on a volunteer fire department. Mm. You know, so they, they expected you. These are, these are the core responsibilities of citizenship. Being an American, being a full-spectrum American, a real American, is being those things. It's not just going to vote. The power elites today want you to think that your only duty as a citizen is to go vote for Oathbreaker A or Oathbreaker B every couple of years, and the rest of the time, you know, leave it to the professionals. And that's why I, I don't like the whole sheepdog meme about, oh, I'm a cop, I'm a sheepdog, because we're not friggin' sheep. You're not supposed to be a nation of sheep guarded by sheepdogs. You're all supposed to be the guardians. So if you don't do that, you're going to wind up under a dictatorship. You're going to wind up in a police state. Take personal responsibility. Embrace your responsibility to be a real American again. And fuck everybody else who doesn't like it. Sorry, I didn't mean to cuss. But <laughs> screw everybody else out there who wants you to just sit on your ass don't be afraid of Southern Poverty Law Center, what they think about you. Go organize. Do what they don't want to do. When I get up every morning, I think to myself, what does Mark Potok not want me to do today? Oh, he doesn't want me to organize a local neighborhood watch. I'll go do that today. <laughs> go do what they don't want you to do. Put yourselves in their shoes. If you're the, if you're the secret squirrel, sneaky peeks at the NSA, what do they want you to do? They want you to be afraid of them. They want you to self-censor. They want you to sit in your house and hide in your basement so they can come get you one at a time. They don't want you to organize. They're afraid of organized communities. They are. Very powerful. That's, and, they're afraid of, and they're afraid of the veterans in particular, and they should be. So. Very powerful stuff. Stuart, I appreciate your time uh, joining us here on the show. Uh, again, for people Any time. It was, it was fun. Awesome. For people who want to find out more, it's oathkeepers.org. I have a sport in the shirt today in, uh, in an effort to help get more people aware, more people awake. And, and you've certainly given a lot of people some insight that I think will, it, I, I hope and I want to believe that it will save a lot of people's lives. So thank you again for joining us. Well, you know, one, one final thing I want to say sure. is, is we're not saying we have all the answers. We're just saying, look, we're just doing the best I, we can to do what we think is, is right. You know, you might have a different way of doing it. God bless you. This is what we think our priorities need to be. You need to get squared away as a community, and you need to reach out to the guys with the guns who are going to be the ones that are going to come enforce it. The more of them on our side, the better for us. Okay. 
wise words. All right, man. All right, thanks again. Thanks.